All right, this chapter, or this video rather, is on local anesthetic. So we're going to learn about the different types of local anesthetic injection sites. We're going to learn about different injections. We're going to learn about whether we use a short needle or a long needle. So let's begin. Okay, before we look at the different types of um, injections there are, let's look at the types of dental local anesthetics. So there's infiltration, there is supraperiosteal, and then there's nerve blocks. And so what, what do they mean? Now we're looking at these video links and I'm gonna put them in the description below. It's just a good visual so that you guys, it's actually a good clip so that you guys um, can see how an infiltration is done, how a supraperiosteal injection is done and how a nerve block is done. But what I want you guys to understand from this slide here is that when we're doing an infiltration injection, an infiltration injection kind of looks like this where you're just injecting into the gum. What happens is the gum is anesthetized. The gum is numbed, not the tooth, not the bone. But when you're doing a supraperiosteal injection, and I'll show you a picture of that, more um, is numb. Sorry, what I mean to say is it's not just the, numb, the gum that's numb, it's the gingiva, it's the teeth, it's the periodontium or the tissues surrounding the teeth that are numb. And I'll show you an image of that shortly. And then we'll look at nerve block and nerve block, it, it numbs everything. It numbs, the, uh, it could numb the teeth and I'll go so over some examples of when it will numb the teeth and when it will not. But it'll also affect or numb the gingiva and the tissues surrounding the teeth. So let's look at this picture first. Now, when we're looking at this, um, what we're looking at over here is a foramen. A foramen is an opening. And from this opening, from this foramen, we're going to see lots of nerves come out, lots of um, arteries and veins come out. And in this chapter, we're, we're strictly focusing on nerves because when we want to do local anesthetic, we need to numb that nerve. We need to deposit anesthetic near that nerve so that it you know, penetrates and it numbs the surrounding tissues. So this is called the infraorbital foramen. It's called infraorbital because infra means below, below what? Below the orbit. Orbit refers to the eye. So there is an infraorbital foramen just below the orbit, below the eye. Now when we're looking at this, you're seeing that if we were to just do an infiltration, and I'll show you a picture of that, what infiltration means is that it just affects that one tooth. So if I'm infiltrating in this area over here, it's just going to affect the central incisor because it's just going to affect that nerve that is close to the central incisor. But if I were to do a nerve block, well, that would go further up. So if you look at where I deposit the anesthetic, it would be further up and it would be right where the nerve trunk is. And then so the, the anesthetic would get deposited over here and it would travel through all these areas and numb all of these areas. So a nerve block reaches more areas and infiltration reaches just one single area. Now, if we choose to do a local infiltration, that's just when you inject into the gum, into the gingiva. And so if we look over here, this needle is penetrating into the gingiva right here, or actually into the papilla in between the teeth. Now, why would someone do this? Why would someone want to just numb the gum alone? Well, the reason for that, one reason why local infiltration is used is because let's say this person is bleeding profusely and you're debriding it and it's so hard for you to see because there's a lot of blood. So one option would be is to give them a local infiltration where you poke inside the gum, the needle gets poked into the gum, and the cartridge within that local anesthetic has a vasoconstrictor, has epinephrine. And if you remember, when you have epinephrine in the local anesthetic, it vasoconstricts, it constricts or squeezes the blood vessel, and that is a good thing because it lessens the amount of blood. So when you do this, the bleeding should decrease and that will help you with debridement. So it's used to control bleeding. That's local infiltration. In dentistry though, we usually use a supraperiosteal injection when we're just when we just want to numb one area. 
So what is a supraperiosteal injection? A supraperiosteal injection is when you are just numbing that one area over here. So let's say I want to numb this area over here, which is the second premolar. You'll see that instead of the, the needle poking the gum, it actually goes way further up and it, it goes just to the towards the root apex, the apex of the root, which is the very tip of the root. And so what gets numbed here? So it's not just the gums, it's the entire tooth. So that individual tooth, so that second premolar will get numb over here. The pulp will get numb. The gums will get numb. The connective tissue, which is the layer underneath the gum, will get numb. So everything really around that tooth will get numb. So if you see here, if you look at where the um, penetration site is, it's not on the gum, it's above, right? It's on the mucobuccal fold, right where the root of the apex of the root is, the tip of the root is. The needle is a short needle. Okay, so we're using a short needle when, because we don't have to go so deep, right? We're just going right here. The If we have to travel further along, like if I had to do an infraorbital block, I have to go further up. So here I would need a longer needle. But when I'm doing an infiltration or a supraperiosteal injection, it's just right here, right? So I don't have, the needle doesn't have to go further up. So I just need a short needle for that. Okay, so short needle for local infiltration, short needle for maxillary superperiosteal injection. And then the mandibular superperiosteal injection, also a short needle. Now here's something interesting. With the mandibular superperiosteal in, um, injection, let's say I want to anesthetize or I want to numb the first molar. Notice that my needle, the order penetration site, is not just underneath the first molar. It's actually one half tooth distal. I'll, I'll, so let me rephrase that. Um, I'm going to come back to that. So the injection site is half tooth distal to the target tooth. So going back over here, this is the tooth I want to numb. I have to go half, so half the size, so half the tooth size distal. So I have to inject around here so that my first molar, mandibular first molar, will get anesthetized. So when you're looking at how to um, penetrate just the mandibular, so we're talking about the penetration site for the mandibular superperiosteal injection, it's always half to distal. So if I want to anesthetize this tooth over here, the premolar, I will go half to distal and put the penetration site would be here. So always half to distal. Another thing to keep in mind is, and this is important to note, is that when we're looking at the maxillary bone versus the mandibular bone, do you notice that the buccal bone of the maxilla is very porous? So porous means like the holes between the bone is quite big. But if you look at the mandibular bone, it's not quite, it's not porous. Like the, the, there's not, the gaps in the, in the bone is not um, as big in the mandibular. It's quite significant in the maxilla. What does this mean? Well, this means that when we're doing a supraperiosteal injection, it's very easy to numb the maxillary teeth because the bone is very porous. So the anesthetic solution can, you know, penetrate easily and get into um, the areas that it needs to reach. Okay, but for the mandible, it's not so easy because it's not as porous. So interestingly enough, because the bone is more dense, it's not as porous, it's harder for the anesthetic to reach the um, teeth in the mandible area. And so what the studies have found is that there's this type of um, anesthetic called articane. Now there's different types of anesthetic you'll learn in farm. There's lidocaine, prilocaine. Well, one of them is articane. Anything that ends in cane is local anesthetic. Articane is the good one for a mandibular supraperiosteal injection. That's the one that is most effective. So when you're doing a mandibular peri uh, supraperiosteal injection, when you just need to numb that one tooth, in the mandible region, you're gonna use articane. Okay, let's look at nerve blocks now. So maxillary nerve blocks. This is where you're numbing a wider, a broader area. So, Earlier, we looked at the infraorbital foramen, and we saw that there's many nerves that, that, that stem or that come out from the infraorbital nerve, and it goes to very different areas. So when we're looking at maxillary nerves, we're going to be looking at different blocks. We're going to be looking at 
posterior alveolar block, middle superior alveolar block, anterior superior alveolar block. Actually, that's just a posterior superior alveolar block. So we'll look at that, and then we'll look at infraorbital block as well. One of the key things to keep in mind here is this is that when we're injecting into this area or when we're applying this local anesthetic, one of the major concerns we have is that we could tear a blood vessel or we could puncture a nerve and, and that could not that could not be uh, that's not a good thing. It could cause pain. It can also cause a hematoma, which is a blood bubble. And we'll look at how that can happen when we're doing that with the when we're so for example, if I'm doing a posterior superior alveolar block or if I'm doing an infraorbital block, which we'll look at, and I um, nick a vein, I could get a hematoma, I could get a blood um, bubble that could come from injecting into the wrong site. This is an excellent visual that comes from the textbook and it just tells you what type of injection or what type of local anesthetic numbs which area. So let's look at some examples here. If I look at the ASA, so anterior, superior, alveolar block, well, first, let's just break down these terms. Anterior means front teeth, so we're looking at the front teeth. Superior means maxilla, the top region, right? Not the mandible. Superior means maxilla. Alveolar block, okay? So this is the ASA block. And what does it do? It blocks, it numbs the teeth as well as the gum and the lip. So everything that's, everything that's shaded in purple is numbed. If we're looking at the MSA block, which is right here, what does it numb? Well, it numbs our premolars. Now, let's dissect this word. Middle means the premolar region. It's the middle area of that quadrant. Superior means it's the maxillary region, not mandibular. And so when we're looking at the middle superior alveolar block, well, what does it numb? It numbs the premolar and the mesiobuccal cusp of the first molar, so the MSA numbs this area right here. When we're looking at the PSA, what does the PSA numb? The PSA, which stands for posterior, so that means the posterior teeth, superior alveolar block. So it's numbing the back teeth, but it's not numbing the mesiobuccal root of the first molar. So if I wanna numb this area right here, I have to do the MSA. I cannot do the PSA, because the PSA will not numb that mesiobuccal root of the maxillary for a smaller. So if I want to debride this entire quad, and, and I want to do the um, this area right here, the mesiobuccal root of the maxillary for a smaller, well, one option I have <clears throat> is that I would have to do a PSA block and an MSA block so that I can numb this area over here. So let's say I just want to numb the premolar and molars. When we're looking at the infraorbital block, and again, we're going to look at this in more detail, infraorbital block, and if you want to know what does it numb, well, if we look at this image over here, it'll numb our upper lip, it'll numb our incisors, our canines, our premolars, and the mesiobuccal root of the maxillary first molar. So all of that gets numb with the infraorbital block. So I could do an infraorbital block. Let's say I want to numb the entire quad over here. I would probably do an infraorbital block. And maybe I would also do a PSA, a posterior superior alveolar block, to numb this side. So that way this whole quadrant is numb. And then I can debride that whole area. Notice over here is just the buckle that's numb, right? The lingual tissues. So... The teeth are anesthetized, but on the lingual, the tissues that I want to do, let's say I'm debriding the lingual side and, and they're very sensitive, the gums are very sensitive. If I need to anesthetize those areas, then I need to do a GP block. What's a GP block? Greater palatine block. So this is where I need to anesthetize the tissues around the, the lingual tissues of the premolar and molar, so the gums get numb here, not the teeth. So the greater palatine does not numb the teeth, it just numbs this entire region right here, so the palate will feel numb, and the lingual gingiva will feel numb. To anesthetize the teeth, you need to do the infraorbital block, which will numb the teeth, and if I wanted to decide the teeth needs to be numb, then I would do the PSA on this side. The nasopalatine block, so this is um, nasal, so it's near the nose, so you know this is more towards the anterior, and this is P for palatine, so it's the palatine. 
by the way, these two injection sites, uh, doing these injections are very painful for the patient, for the client, because it's on the palate, and the palate has very dense tissues, and it's a lot more painful. So we'll go over how to minimize the pain for that, um, for the client when we do this. But when we're looking at nasopalatine, what's happening is that we're numbing the, not the teeth, but the tissues, the gum, and the palate around the incisor area right here. So everything that you see in green is anesthetized. Okay, and then so this is a good visual, and then there's inferior alveolar block, and if we were to dissect that word, inferior means post, like inferior means mandible, right? So it's the bottom that's affected, and so what happens is all of this is numb, which we'll look at in more detail. So when you see inferior, it's referring to mandible. When you see superior, it's referring to maxilla. Okay, so let's look at the PSA, the posterior superior alveolar block. What does it numb? Let's see. So here is the PSA. Now I just want to show you this over here is the is where you would it's the penetration site for the PSA for the posterior superior alveolar block. This over here is what you would do where you would um inject if you're doing a supraperiosteal injection. So if you want to numb that one tooth over here, you would do you would inject here. Now sometimes if we take the needle, if we're doing a supraperiosteal injection and we take the needle a bit too far, um, so a bit too distal and superior, then what happens is instead of us doing a supraperiosteal block where we're just numbing that one tooth, we end up doing a PSA, posterior superior alveolar block, where we're numbing the entire posterior teeth. So just something to keep keep in mind. Um, that are, that it just goes to show that the injection site is extremely important because if we go more further back and up, then we're doing a whole PSA block where we're numbing all three teeth when we really we just wanted to numb that one tooth. So what happens in a PSA? We're using a short needle. So we're using a short needle with PSA because, again, we're not going so far. And what is it anesthetizing? Well, it's going to anesthetize the entire, um, all the maxillary molars except the mesiobuccal cusp. Remember, the mesiobuccal cusp does not get anesthetized with PSA. It will with MSA. But the teeth get anesthetized. The bones get anesthetized or, or numb. And then the buccal tissues, not the, remember, it's always only the buccal, not the lingual, because the lingual, you need to do a palatine block to get the lingual numb. And so if we're looking at where the, they're injecting, it is... Um, around this area right here, which is kind of close to the maxillary tuberosity. Right here is the maxillary tuberosity, and it's right above that. Now, this is something to keep in mind. The posterior superior alveolar, right, we're kind of injecting into this vicinity over here, but if we go a little bit back and we nick this right area right here, which is called the pterygoid plexus of vein, this is like a very rich vascular area of, of um, nerve tissues and also blood vessels, you really want to be careful that we don't nick anything here. Now, usually the needle tip is not here. The needle tip is always more um, anterior and more below, more inferior to the pterygoid plexus. But if you accidentally nick that area, you're going to get a hematoma, a blood bubble. And so to treat that, you would, you would put ice in that. It's not painful. Having a hematoma is not painful. It just looks like a really nasty blood bubble. Um, it just feels weird, but it's not painful. It does go away in a few days. To treat that, apply heat. Uh, sorry, not heat. Ice. Ice. The only time you want to apply heat is when you're doing, um, when you have a lockjaw. So when you have trismus or lockjaw, you want to apply heat. But for a hematoma, when you nick the pterygoid plexus and you have a blood bubble, it's ice. You give them ice or you ice that area. Okay, MSA, middle superior alveolar block. So remember here, it is just the premolar area that is being numb, as well as the mesiobuccal cusp of that first molar. Just the mesial root gets numbed. And remember, it's just the buccal side that gets numb. Okay, so if we're looking over here at the MSA. You are seeing that it's just um, above the second molar, second premolar. Okay, just above the second premolar in the mucobuccal fold. So this is the mucobuccal fold. This is the gingiva. 
this is the mucobuccal fold or albuminal mucosa or mucobuccal fold and you're injecting right above the second premolar here and when you do that what gets numbed all these areas over here so the pulp of the teeth the the buccal gingiva and the bone and the mesial buccal or the mesial root of the first molar short needle is also used here because we're not going so far right we don't need to go so far up so it's just a short needle let's look at the anterior superior alveolar block so asa right and what gets numbed here asa anterior refers to the anterior teeth so just the anterior teeth the canine the lateral incisor and the central incisor gets numbed here. And where do you inject? You inject right in on top of the maxillary canine on the mucobuccal, or mucogingival fold. So let me show, and you're using a short needle, but we're not going so far. We don't need to go far up. It's a short needle. So let's look at a better image. Here's your canine. You penetrate right onto the mucobuccal or mucogingival fold right here, just um, mesial to the canine. And what gets numbed? all of these areas here so the pulp of the, so the teeth get numb the facial tissues um, get numb the bones of the teeth get numb remember the lingual side does not get numb you need a nasopalatine block to numb the lingual um, tissues but the teeth get numbed the um, gums get numbed and the bones get numbed in the anterior region short needles also used for this as well Okay, now the last maxillary uh, nerve block we're going to look at is called the infraorbital. So infraorbital, remember infraorbital block is just right near the infraorbital foramen, which is going to numb all these areas right here. Now when you put the needle in, when you're doing the injection, you want to massage the anesthetic. So you're going to massage the, the region over here. And when you massage that, what happens is the local anesthetic gets into the foramen. Something that's really, really important to note is that when we're doing when we're um, doing an infraorbital block, we're not going to aim the needle into the foramen. You don't want to do that. Why? If you inject into the foramen, you're going to puncture the blood vessels. You're going to puncture the nerve. You could even enter the orbit of the eye. Ouch. Right? So you don't want to do that. Those are potential complications that you do not want to do. So when you um, inject, you're injecting very close to the foramen, not into the foramen, not into the hole. So let's look at this. Oh, actually, do you see how it's a long needle? Here you're going to use a long needle because there's a long way up, right? With all the other ones, you just needed to inject around this area here. But with the infraorbital, you want the um, the anesthetic to kind of get deposited close to the nerve trunk right over here. And so you need a long needle to reach that area. Okay, so what, where, where do you aim? So when you're doing an infraorbital injection, you're going right above the maxillary first premolar. So the maxillary first premolar, you go right above there. Really be careful you're not injecting into the foramen. And so what gets numbed? Okay, so what gets numbed is your maxillary anterior teeth. So all the anterior teeth, all your premolars, and the mesial buccal cusp of the first molar so all of this region here plus the mesial buccal cusp you'll also notice like if you've ever had this done that the bottom of your eye feels a little feels numb the side of your nose feels numb it's a very funny feeling lower eyelid the lateral aspect of your nose and your upper lip also feels numb so if we look over here right above the first premolar you inject as a long needle because it's got a long way to go but remember we're not putting the needle inside the foramen just um, you know it would go somewhere around here and then you just massage it after the injection you massage so that the anesthetic goes into the foramen and you're never poking um, the vessels in the foramen because that can cause a hematoma that can nick the um, the vessels okay so all the ones we looked at we looked at infraorbital block we looked at actually let me go back to that picture of that I loved right here. So when we looked at the infraorbital block, the ASA, the MSA, and the PSA, if we look at Sasha, let, let me, um, you'll see that it's just 
the facial or buccal tissues that got numbed here. But what if we want to numb the lingual tissues? Well, with the lingual tissues, you got to do the nasopalatine block or the greater palatine block. Nasopalatine for anterior teeth, greater palatine for posterior teeth. So now that we're looking at palatal nerve blocks, we're going to use a short needle to do the nasopalatine block. So nasal for the nose, so it's close to the nose. So we're just going to numb the... Um, the tissues around the anterior teeth. Now something to keep in mind, with the nasopalatine block, the teeth are not anesthetized. The teeth don't get numb. The teeth only get numb through, I mean, sometimes it can happen, but not always. The teeth get numb through all these other blocks like infraorbital block or ASA block. Those numb the teeth. But notice that when you're looking at nasopalatine or greater palatine, the teeth are not shaded because they don't get numb. I mean, the only way it gets numbed is if, for some reason, <clears throat> it, it's um, it, it's very rare. Let's just say it's rare. I, I shouldn't say rare, but it could happen. But your goal when you're doing the nasal palatine and greater palatine is that it would just numb the tissues, not the teeth. So let's look at the nasal palatine block. So see how it says teeth are not anesthetized and we're injecting really close to the um, incisive foramen. This is called the incisive foramen because incisive for incisors. So it's a hole or foramen near the incisors and you're using a short needle. And when you're injecting, you're not putting it inside the incisive foramen because that's very painful. You're just going to put it really, really close to that. Um, and uh, this is actually a very painful injection. So do not enter the foramen. Do not enter that area right here because we'll, we'll cause some complications. We'll nick some arteries. We'll nick some veins, which we don't want to do. And we're, again, we're using a short needle. This is the greater palatine block. So just these areas are getting numbed here, not the teeth, right? So teeth are not anesthetized. And um, this is your greater palatine for Raymond, and that numbs the hard palate. And so you're injecting very close to the greater palatine. It's actually a little anterior to the greater palatine for Raymond. And when you do that, you numb all these area right here. Okay, how do you reduce pain? So when any time you're offering local anesthesia to your client, one of the number one things you're taught or you will be taught is to inject very slowly. So as you're injecting, whether it be on the palate or, or on the mucobuccal fold, whether you're doing um, a palatal injection or all the other injections that we looked at, you want to inject very slowly. And the reason for that is you want to take your time in allowing the anesthetic to spread in the tissues. If you inject really fast, it's going to be very painful. So you want to inject very slow so that the anesthetic has, has the time to spread in the tissues. Another thing to lessen the pain is to use pressure anesthesia. So what that means is that, let's say you're doing a palatal block, you would apply pressure with a cotton tip applicator, not like the 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 bottom of the mirrors, because that's more painful. You want to use something more um, less painful, like a cotton tip applicator, and you apply pressure into this area over here. You apply the pressure before the local anesthetic, during the local anesthetic, and after the local anesthetic. And the trick is, it's kind of like a dull ache for the pain for the client, um, and so kind of. What happens is the client feels the pressure more than the pain, and the pressure pain is, the pressure is more tolerable than the pain they would feel, right? So, um, the pressure anesthesia basically means applying pressure before, during, and after the local anesthetic, and it tr tricks the um, the brain to feeling pressure rather than pain. Okay, so we did all the maxillary blocks. Now we're moving on to the mandibular nerve blocks. And when we're looking at the mandibular nerve blocks, I want to remind you of the trigeminal nerve. So the trigeminal nerve, tri for three, has three main nerves that come out from the trigeminal nerve. There's one called the ophthalmic nerve or, or the ophthalmic branch. There's another one called the maxillary nerve or the maxillary branch. And then we have the mandibular nerve or mandibular branch. And that one goes to the mandibular teeth. 
So from the mandibular branch, we'll also see an inferior alveolar nerve, which numbs the entire mandible region in that quadrant, in that area. There's also a lingual nerve that just goes to the back. So when we're doing an inferior alveolar nerve block, what we're doing when we do this, we want to numb the inferior alveolar nerve, which is which will numb all the teeth and surrounding tissues around here. And then we also want to numb the lingual nerve so that the lingual side also gets numb. So let's look at that. Um, the reason why articane is bold here is because we already talked about this. When we're doing a supraperiosteal injection, when we're just numbing one tooth, um, it, because it's so dense, you, we use articane. And this is more so the case in anterior teeth versus posterior teeth. So in the anterior teeth, we see that um, articane is really the best local anesthetic to use because it can really go into that dense mandibular bone because it's not as porous, it doesn't have that many holes. Um, we're gonna, so let's look at inferior alveolar block in more detail. Oh, notice that we're using a long needle and I'll show you why, because you gotta go further down um, to, to access or to reach the inferior alveolar nerve. So we're using a long needle. Now um, you're kind of, there's a technique to using the inferior alveolar nerve because you kind of have to, there's landmarks that we have to look at. Um, I'm not going to focus on that in this video, but what I want you guys to know is that when we're doing an inferior alveolar nerve block, the um, the needle comes from the opposite angle, like you're, you're crossing over from the opposite arch. And what you're doing is you're going to deposit the solution very close to the inferior alveolar nerve. So as you're um, bringing the needle in, you'll feel the bone. And as soon as you feel the bone, you just retract a little bit and you deposit the solution near the inferior alveolar nerve. And then what happens is you withdraw the needle halfway and you'll be near the lingual nerve and you deposit more anesthetic there. And that way the inferior alveolar nerve gets anesthetized or gets numbed, and so does the lingual nerve. So again, when you're doing this, you're injecting one time only, and you inject further back, and you um, deposit a few anesthetic in the inferior alveolar nerve, and then you go further back, and you um, halfway, so you, you just retract a little bit, halfway is still inside, the needle is still inside the tissue, and then you deposit in the lingual nerve. So you deposit a few anesthetic there, and then you go. There, and then you come out. There's something called aspiration, which is where you um, retract the um, sorry, the plunger. So retract the plunger um, with your thumb. You push the, plun the plunger backwards and you want to make sure there's no blood that comes out. Because if there's blood that comes out, you have nicked um, a artery, like one of the vet blood vessels. So you got to start over, put the needle, uh, take the needle out, replace the cartridge, and then we do it. So it's really important that we aspirate, we pull back on the plunger, and then we look at the cartridge. And as long as there's no blood coming out there, you're in the right area. And so you can go ahead and deposit the solution. So the inferior alveolar nerve block, you're using a long needle. Okay, and what you're doing is see how you're... Um, coming out at an angle, you're going in from this side to uh, inject into the inferior alveolar nerve and all the mandible teeth will be numbed with this. All the facial um, tissues of the anterior teeth will be numb. So let's look at uh, this in more detail. I kind of want to focus on this one right here, the deposition side. So when you're penetrating that area here, you are numbing, so you're reaching the inferior alveolar nerve, you're going to um, deposit a few solution, then you're going to withdraw the needle halfway and deposit a few more solution and, or anesthetic so that the lingual nerve gets numbed. And when the lingual nerve gets numb, it will numb the lingual tissues. So here you'll feel like your lower lip is numb, um, but really the entire quadrant is numb over here. Um, you'll feel the lower lip, the gums, the teeth, they're all numb. So when you're doing the, just if you had to do a lingual nerve block, you're just numbing the lingual tissues, not the teeth. The teeth get numb through the inferior alveolar block. Okay. Now let's look at the mental nerve block. So this mental incisive nerve block uh, 
commonly get um, mistaken. So let's just, or it can get confused. So let's look at the difference between the two. I just want to go back and look at this image right here. So this is the inferior alveolar nerve right here. Um, and then this is the lingual nerve, which is right here. Sorry, it's our inferior alveolar nerve, lingual nerve. And so if you aim to get the, if you aim over here, the needle over here and deposit a few, the inferior alveolar nerve will get numb. And if you retract the needle a little bit and then aim for this vicinity here, the lingual nerve will get numb. So that's kind of how it works. There's also a buccal um, block, which we'll look at, which is on the opposite side, where you're just blocking the buccal tissues. So not the teeth, just the buccal tissues. If you ever had to do that, uh, that is an option, a buccal block. So let's look at mental and incisive nerve block. Now for the mental and incisive nerve block, we're depositing the anesthetic right above the mental foramen. So mental refers to chin, okay? So chin, and there's a foramen, there's a hole right here where all the blood vessels, all the nerves are coming out from around that area. And you wanna inject somewhere really close to this area. So you're, you're um, depositing the anesthetic above, right over, over here, and just anterior to the mental uh, foramen. So just an anterior to the mental foramen. You're not entering the mental foramen. But if you are doing an incisive nerve block, and I'll, we'll go over the difference between mental and incisive, the key difference is with, when you're doing an incisive nerve block, we're massaging the anesthetic, and when we're massaging it, so we're taking a fingertip and we're massaging their chin so that the anesthetic goes into the foramen. So let's look at this. So this is the mental nerve block. And in the mental nerve block, the teeth are not anesthetized, okay? It's just the facial tissues that are anesthetized, the lower lip, the skin of the chin, that all feels numb as well. We're using a short needle because we're not going so far deep, okay? And we're just like aiming for right above the mental foramen. So which is right between the premolars. So right between the premolars is where we're putting the uh, needle to the position site. Now, if we're doing an incisive nerve block, same thing, you're doing the same thing, just something to note. Here, what happens is the teeth do get numb. Mental nerve block, teeth are not anesthetized, it's just the facial tissues that are anesthetized, the soft tissues. But when we're doing an incisive nerve block, the teeth do get anesthetized. So from the second molar all the way to the central incisor, all of that get numbed, as well as the skin of the chin, the lower lip, all of that gets numb. What is the difference here? So again, you're using a short needle, you're using, you're doing exactly the same thing as a mental nerve block. The only difference is the massaging. So you need to massage that area. So once you're done, you would um, retract the needle and you would massage their chin area, put pressure there so that it goes into the mental foramen, so that the solution goes into the mental foramen and numbs those teeth. Okay, so incisive block, it's a, it's a variation of the mental block. The only difference is pressure is applied so that the teeth can get numb. If we don't apply pressure, it's kind of like a mental nerve block and the teeth won't get numb, just the, uh, the gums and the lips and the, the chin will feel numb, but not the teeth. So it's important to apply pressure if we want the teeth to get numb so that it becomes an incisive block. Now we're looking at buckle. So if we're looking at the buckle, it's just numbing the buccal side, not the teeth. Okay, so we're, we're anesthetizing the buccal nerve and it's a, it's a short needle. Actually both, incisive and buccal are both short needles. And let's see if I can show you a picture, here we go. So we're injecting kind of like right over here, which is uh, very close to the buccal nerve. So you're going, you're injecting into the vestibule and it's distal, and buckle to the most posterior molar. So here's your posterior molar, you're going back um, and buckle, right? You're going a little bit further back and buckle to that. And with this one, you're just numbing these area right here, the soft tissues on the, where the mandibular molars are. Okay, so the mandibular molars, the soft tissues, the teeth are not anesthetized. So if we look here, it's only where the mandibular molars are, those areas get numbed here. The soft tissues around the mandibular molars get numbed there. And you're using a short needle because you don't have to go so far deep. Short needle. 
Now we looked at inferior, actually, yeah, we did look at the inferior alveolar block, right? So the inferior alveolar block, first use of this, is where you numb this whole region right here, half of your tongue actually gets numbed too. So the whole quadrant gets numbed here, except the, um, the buccal tissues along the mandibular molar. If you wanted to numb the buccal tissues of the mandibular molar, you do a buccal block. But basically with the inferior alveolar block, pretty much everything in the quadrant gets numb with the exception of the buccal tissues around the mandibular molars. Now, sometimes this doesn't work. Sometimes doing an infraorbital, um, sorry, not infraorbital, inferior alveolar block does not work. So what are our options if it doesn't work? Well, there's other options. There's something called a Gaugates block. And the Gaugates, again, all your mandibular teeth on that one side is blocked as well as your tongue and everything. But, and, and so this is where, so if you look here, this is the inferior alveolar nerve and you inject around this area right here. The gout gates, you go further up. So you, for, you go further up and then you hope that it uh, would numb all of this teeth. So this, it does require more skill to perform. I'll put this video link um, on, in the description below so you can see how it's done. But you're going further up, it's, it's uh, another option. So if, if the patient's mouth still stays open and you inject further up and you do the Gaugates technique with people who are um, ha have a history of failure with inferior alveolar blocks. Then we have this other block. Now let's say someone has a locked jaw and they just cannot open or let's say, um, you know, they have so much anxiety and they get scared of opening their mouth or whatever the reason might be and they're not able to open wide for you to do the inferior alveolar block or to do the gout gates, then another option is to use the a different technique, which is called the Vazirani Akinosi block. And this is only used if the patient cannot open their mouth very wide. And again, I'll put that video description below. And so you're injecting, you're using this type of um, anesthetic with in a closed mouth. So gout gates, open mouth, Vazirani Akinosi, closed mouth. Both use a long needle because both you got to go further back. So these um, mandibular nerve blocks, you want to use a long needle. This is a great table summary that comes from your textbook and it goes over, you know, what numb. So if, if you didn't, didn't like that visual, I mean, I love that visual, but if you didn't like that visual with the teeth and the shaded areas of what it numbs, here's another one, uh, another way to study. So P P PSA, posterior superior alveolar, what does it numb? It numbs the maxillary molars, it actually numbs the sinus, and it'll numb the buccal mucosa or the, and the gingiva. MSA, what does it numb? It numbs the maxillary premolars and the mesiobuccal root of the first molar. ASA, what does it block, right? So you can see over here what um, gets blocked based on which nerve. I like this one because this one goes, this um, table over here, so I'm just gonna move something on my end. This is, um, I got this from a website, the RDH magazine. This one tells you which needle to use and which gauge to use, whether it be 25 or 27. So which one to use for each block, for each injection. And you'll notice here that when you're doing a mandibular block, we're always using long. Same thing with infraorbital. Infraorbital, this is a maxillary block. This is where you're going further up and you're anesthetizing the premolars and the anterior teeth in that quadrant. So infraorbital block, you're using long because you got to you got to go up a long way. But all the other blocks that we looked at are all short. Now, what does this mean, 25 or 27? It just means if we're looking at the needle opening, the gauge, 25 means it's, it's a bigger opening, whereas 27 is a smaller opening. So that's really the difference between 25 and 27. Sometimes we, you know, um, a narrow opening. So the bigger the number, the narrower the opening, the narrower the gauge. Sometimes we would prefer that one. Sometimes we prefer 25 gauge, a little bigger opening. So that's what that means. So if, you know, you can use this table in case the board exam asks you questions about when do you use long needle? When do you use short needle? What do we use? Do we use 25 or do we use 27 gauge? So this is a good uh, review over here. Awesome. All right. Well, I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, let me know below.